everyone. It's Rena Jadav with the Live Longer Podcast and Health Boot Camps. And today we have truly a goddess in gut healing, as I call her. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride is a trained MD who is the founder of the GAPS protocol, the GAPS program, which is one of the programs that I followed when I had my huge gut health crisis a couple of years ago. She's a trained MD and has a postgraduate in neurology. And she has a beautiful story where when she first got started, um, she'd been practicing for five years as a neurologist, three years as a neurosurgeon. She started her family, and then fairly shortly after that, her son was diagnosed autistic. And that prompted her journey into creating the GAPS program, where she worked with thousands of patients after she had helped heal her son, completely from, from being on the autistic spectrum and was able to then bring the brilliance of her research and her program, the GAPS protocol, to the world. I'm so excited to have you here with us today, Dr. Natasha, welcome. Thank you for inviting me, I'm glad to be here. Absolutely, so let's get started with uh, the first most important question that's been in my mind for the years that I was doing this protocol, how walk us through how you decided to create this protocol what was the brilliant insight that you saw in your research that led you to create this i realized from my own child and all the thousands of patients that i saw in my clinic that all of these conditions that i see are stemming from one place and it isn't a new idea at all it was stated by the father of modern medicine hippocrates all those thousands of years ago that all disease begins in the gut. And I've realized pretty much with every patient that I saw, just how correct he was indeed, that every disease begins in the gut. And that's where we have to begin. No matter how far away the symptoms might manifest from the digestive system, might be in the brain, might be in the lungs, might be in the joints, might be in the skin, uh, the roots of the disorder are in the digestive system. And now having worked with, um, in my clinic and worked with the GAPS nutritional protocol for more than 20 years now, I am more sure of that than ever. <laughs> I just get confirmation of that every single day. When we talk about the digestive system, we have to talk about what lives there and what takes care of it. Western medicine got interested in that microbial community that lives inside the digestive system, which is called gut flora only in the last few years. But the research in that area was going on for the last hundred years in different countries around the world. And I was familiar with that research because one of the major um, hubs for that research was the Soviet Union. And that's where I grew up and that's where I was trained as a medical doctor. So I knew what gut flora does for us and how it can affect the human health. Now we know that about 90% of all cells in the human body 90% are in our gut flora. So your body is only 10%. It's a shell, That's a habitat incredible. for this mass of microbes that live inside us. And we ignore them at our peril. It is a very sophisticated, very complex community of various creatures, starting from tiny viruses, bacteria, then moving to larger protozoa, then moving to larger fungi, and then moving to flukes and worms and emitter long things. And all of these things live in a harmony with each other and in a harmony with you, with your body. And that is when the body is healthy and the gut flora is healthy, when everything is, is healthy and there is a harmony. And all these species of microbes and other creatures in there, they plant each other and they harvest each other and they eat each other and they control each other. They don't allow anyone to get out of control, to overgrow and to start causing trouble. Problem is, we human beings are very good at creating imbalances. <laughs> you know, very good at that. And we've been at, uh, at, at it, creating imbalances, not only outside our bodies, but inside our bodies too, for the last 70, 80 years, possibly longer. Ever since antibiotics were discovered and really humanity started using them in large amounts in the 60s, starting from 60s, 70s, Every time we take a broad step from antibiotic, we kill off a large portion of bacteria in our digestive system. These bacteria were controlling all kinds of other creatures, creatures which are resistant to antibiotics. Antibiotics don't touch them. 
So when this bacteria wiped out, all these other creatures suddenly find that they're not controlled anymore. So they overgrow and they produce babies very quickly and they occupy large niches in the digestive system. The bacteria do recover if the course of antibiotic was short and if they don't happen very often, they do recover, but different species take between two weeks to two months to recover. And that's a window of opportunity for all those other microbes and other life forms in the gut to establish themselves, to grow. So the recovering bacteria have a fight on their hands. So from a course of antibiotic to the next course of antibiotic and to the next course of antibiotic, there is less and less of the balance and health there is in the gut and more and more of an imbalance and disease brewing and developing. Until a certain threshold is reached when the balance is gone and that's when your gut flora becomes pathogenic. When there are all kinds of creatures that have grown in there, whoever has one, whoever's got their different positions in there, and uh, whatever deals they made with everybody else around, <laughs> it's an unhealthy situation. They digest food in their own way, converting it into thousands of very toxic poisonous substances. At the same time, they damage the integrity of the gut wall, making it porous and leaky, literally holes develop in the gut wall. As a result, things which should not absorb normally through the gut wall start absorbing. Foods don't get a chance to be digested properly before they absorb. They absorb partially digested, undigested. Then your immune system finds them in the blood, in the lymph, looks at them and says, you're not food. I don't recognize you as food, and attacks them. And that attack manifests itself as food allergy or intolerance. And it can be any symptom under the sun. Depending where these complexes get to, these undigested foods with all the immune cells attached to them, if they get in your joints, you will get uh, arthritis. If they get in your brain, you will get psychological mental problems. If they get into your lungs, you'll get asthma or something else. If they get into your skin, you can get psoriasis, eczema or something else, another, another rash. So wherever they get you, they cause problems. And then all these toxins that the gut flora manufactures also absorb. As a result in the person like that, uh, their digestive system, instead of being a source of nourishment for the person, becomes a major source of toxicity in the body. A river of toxic things flows from the gut into the blood, into the lymph, and get distributed all over the body. And wherever these things get to, they cause symptoms, they cause problems, they cause diseases. So the disease can manifest itself quite far away from the digestive system, but the cause of it, the root cause of it, is likely to be in the digestive system. This situation I have called gaps, gut and psychology syndrome, or gut and physiology syndrome. In the English language, both abbreviate to the same gaps. Gut and psychology syndrome is the book that I've written in 2004, it's in its second edition, and uh, it describes what can happen with the brain of the person and how mental illness develops and how learning disabilities develop. Gut and physiology syndrome is the term I have given to all the rest of the body, which covers asthma and eczema and arthritis and psoriasis and uh, various, various autoimmune disease, various, various physical problems that can develop in the body of a person who has gaps, who has damaged gut flora, damaged gut wall, where their digestive system, instead of feeding the person, is actually poisoning the person and triggering a whole cascade of problems and symptoms uh, in the and body. And that was me, right? Dr. Natasha and I were chatting before we started recording and that was really me. And I think people don't understand that when you get that toxic, you actually can die from it. The gut oh. is the core that's keeping us alive, that's keeping us healthy. And to your point, you know, we're 90% uh, flora and, and bacteria and viruses and other amazing organisms that are in our gut, we're only 10% human, so to speak. And so if we don't take really good care of our gut, you know, it's, it's obvious what can happen. And I've lived through that once. So, so the yeah, question- You understand it, yeah. Yeah, I personally understand it extremely well. I mean, your gut can end up becoming an empty pipe where you're losing a pound a week because it doesn't matter what you eat, nothing is getting absorbed. So the question I have for you, Dr. Natasha, is what has changed in the last decade, two decades, 
that we are starting to see sort of this epidemic of gut issues. And of course, autism as an example in itself has exploded. You know, the numbers of children that are suffering from autism has risen at, at ridiculous numbers. And the forecast is even worse. You know, we're looking at something like one in 10 kids will be autistic in the next couple of decades. What is the reason for this? The reason for this is the environment that the humans have created on our planet, particularly um, after the Second World War. That's when the environment really started changing. And the second, uh, you all know what's happened in the environment, what's changing. Uh, our chemical industry is producing best part of 100,000 new chemicals that don't exist on, in nature. And we're all exposed to these things. The uh, antibiotics people are taking not through prescription only, but our food is laced with antibiotics because um, all pesticides and fungicides and many other chemicals that are sprayed on our fields, on vegetables, fruit, on grains, beans, and all other plant matter that is grown commercially is laced with these chemicals. In their nature, these chemicals are antibiotics. Every time you eat bread, pasta, grains, vegetables, fruit, you're eating antibiotics. You're damaging the, the composition of your gut flora. Commercially grown animals and everything these animals give us, the meat, milk, eggs, fish, also farmed fish, are routinely given antibiotics. Because of the way they're grown, it's very unhealthy, it's very unnatural to these animals, so these animals are unhealthy uh, and, and ill. So antibiotics are given to them routinely. So every time we eat animal foods, we're consuming antibiotics. And many chemicals in our environment are antibiotics in their nature. So our gut flora has been sustaining a, a, an attack on it, starting from the Second World War, really, even before then. Wow. But a very important factor here is how gut flora is passed. Parents pass their gut flora to their child at the moment of birth. For a long time, we thought that uh, a baby is sterile while the baby spends nine months inside the mother. Now, recent research has uh, discovered that actually there is that uterus is not sterile. Placenta is not sterile. We have placental flora. We have uterine flora. We have flora in our abdominal cavity, in the fallopian tubes. On the, um, we've got flora everywhere. So babies start acquiring their flora from the mother during uh, pregnancy. But then the bulk of the gut flora comes in when the baby goes through the birth canal at the moment of birth. The baby swallows mouthfuls of microbes that live in the mother's vagina. Vagina is a richly populated part of the woman's body. And vaginal flora comes from two sources. One is her own bowel. So if a woman has got abnormal gut flora, she will have abnormal flora in her vagina, and that's what she will pass to her baby at the moment of birth. And second source is the father. The father would have his own flora in the groin and all the organs in the groin that he shares with the mother on a regular basis. And that flora comes from his bowel. So if a father has abnormal gut flora, he will have abnormal flora in the groin, and that's what he is sharing with the mother on a regular basis. That's how both parents pass their gut flora to the baby at the moment of birth. Babies who are born uh, through cesarean section, their flora is more opportunistic. It comes from the hands from, of people who look after the baby, from the nipples of the mother, if the child is breastfed, and from the environment. So usually babies who are born uh, through C-section have less diversity in their guts. Diversity is everything. We need to have a full diversity of different, different microbes all being present in the gut. And babies who are born vaginally get better diversity than babies who are born through a, a C-section. Before I talk about the health of the child in my clinic, I always talk about the health of the parents first, yeah. and siblings, and the health of the grandparents. And a typical picture has emerged. If grandparents in the 50s and 60s and 70s maybe, got a couple of courses of antibiotics because antibiotics only just started coming onto the market, which damaged their gut flora slightly. Then they passed that slightly damaged gut flora to their children who were born in, let's say, 60s, 70s, 80s. And then these children grew up in a very different world. Very, very different world. First of all, antibiotics were given to them throughout childhood for every cough and sneeze. Absolutely. Damaging their gut flora further. Secondly, junk food came onto the market at the same time, which feeds almost exclusively pathogenic species in the gut and alters the whole composition of the gut flora. Then uh, 
Breastfeeding went out of fashion and all the formula milk came on the market at the same time. Breastfeeding is absolutely essential for a child to develop normal gut flora because it encourages the growth of the right composition of microbes in the gut. No formula milk can ever come close in its quality to the breast, breast milk. So many of these uh, youngsters were not breastfed. And then the amount of chemicals that they were exposed to during their childhood is, is increasing all the time and many of these chemicals accumulate. And then at the age of 14, 15, 16, that generation of young ladies was put on a contraceptive pill, which they took for quite a few years before they were ready to start their family. Contraceptive pill has a devastating effect on the gut flora. So by the time this generation of youngsters uh, start their family, they're passing seriously damaged gut flora to their babies. And with every generation, what I see, this situation is getting deeper and deeper, worse and worse. Ladies who are having their children this year are passing worse gut flora to their babies than ladies who were having babies even last year or three years ago or, or five years ago. Every year, this situation is getting worse and worse. It's an epidemic, and I call it a GAPS epidemic, epidemic of abnormalities in the gut flora. It's getting deeper and deeper, and it is the epidemic that is the real root cause underlying all other epidemics that we see. A child who acquired abnormal gut flora from the parents from day one of, of their life acquired compromised constitution. This child is not going to react to vaccinations appropriately. This child is not going to be able to digest food appropriately. And these are the children who then develop autism and hyperactivity and dyslexia, dyspraxia, allergies, asthma, eczema, diabetes type 1, and all other conditions that have gained epidemic proportions um, in the Western world in particular. Indeed, there is an epidemic of autism. Uh, it is predicted now uh, when I started practicing as a medical doctor. We were diagnosing one child in 10,000 autistic. Today, we are diagnosing one child in 35, 36. And yeah. the scientists have already projected that line to 2020s, and they're predicting that by 2020s, we will, we'll be diagnosing one child in two. One Half child in two? In two, not in 10, in two. So Half of our children, Yes, half of our boys in particular will be autistic. And the other half is not going to be healthy either. They're going to have hyperactivity, diabetes type 1, rheumatoid arthritis, dyslexia, dyspraxia, schizophrenia, you name it. All kinds of conditions are becoming epidemic. It's a question of even survival. I mean, no one's talking about it. But the more I listen to doctors like yourself, Dr. Mark Hyman and others, Dr. Zach Bush, I feel like it's it's an existential crisis for us, right? We, as a, at least in America, you know, I'm sure we don't have these kinds of chemical antibiotic laced issues in, you know, some parts of the world. But here in America, I feel like it's almost a, a crisis of, of existence for the future generations. So- America is at the forefront of this epidemic. It has the worst statistics. Dr. Natasha, you, worst you've been a very, very grim, very bleak picture of the fact that we are looking at a future that's a very sick future for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren, God forbid. Let's start talking about the fix. So the first thing you mentioned is we all have toxic guts. And I can tell you from my own experience, I was one of them. And I had to take rifaximin, I had SIBO, I had leaky gut. And when I had my gut testing done by Viome a few months ago, it still, despite now me feeling really good 15 months later, it still said that I have an overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria, I don't have a lot of variety, and that I have very few healthy species. And I was blown away because I thought I'd been doing so great and that my gut would have, you know, balanced itself out that I was going to get this A grade, as I say, you know, on my test, on my gut test, I would have an A and it's still a C. So let's start with, because um, this, this is a series of questions, you know, let's start with, first of all, what is the most important thing someone can do today, starting immediately to get their gut not being toxic? 
Well, I have developed the GAPS nutritional protocol. It is a program, and the most important part of it is the diet, logically, because we're dealing with digestive disorders, and our digestive system is a long tube. What you fill yes. that tube with has a direct effect on its well-being. So diet is absolutely not uh, optional. It is mm -hmm. the most important intervention. My patients have called the diet that I have created the GAPS diet. And uh, um, what we do in that diet, we change the gut flora, we alter the gut flora, we bring it more to normality, and we heal and seal the gut wall. We close all those holes in the gut wall. So food has the chance to be digested properly before it absorbs. And as a result, food allergies and intolerances disappear naturally. Instead of focusing on the food, we focus on the gut wall. We need to close it up. We need to seal it. And the beauty of the gut wall is that it is lined by very specialized cells called enterocytes. And these cells only live a few days. Mm. Human body doesn't waste time on healing a sick cell. It just kills it and removes it. <laughs> and to replace it, it gives birth to a new baby cell. To replace it. New, virgin, beautiful baby cell. But if the person still has damaging elements that are going on in the gut and elsewhere in the body, these new, newly born baby cells get damaged immediately as soon as they're born. And as a result, the disease gets perpetuated. But if you remove the damaging element, if you change the gut flora, and it takes time, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, then the gut wall will rebuild itself. So what we do with the GAPS diet, we basically build a new gut for the person. Yes. We create a new gut. And what the GAPS diet does, it removes all the foods that are difficult to digest and which feed pathogenic microbes in the gut. You have to remove those, those foods. Let's and, uh, and at the same time, we provide intensive nourishment for the gut wall. Because in order for the gut wall to rebuild itself, it has to give birth to trillions of new baby cells. And these cells need to be made from something. Building materials are required. So the GAPS diet will provide intensive amounts of building materials to give birth, for the, for the body to give birth to all those trillions of cells to rebuild new gut wall for the person. And once that moment happens, it can take from a few months for a, a person with a milder condition to a few years for a person with a more severe situation. And once that happens, it happens gradually. That level of toxicity that was coming from the gut into the blood and being distributed all over the body stops. And once it stops, the body starts cleaning itself up, removing toxins, removing chemicals, and rebuilding itself. Because all cells in the human body, in every organ, including the brain, only live a short life. They die and they get replaced by newly born cells. And as long as we keep piling in the building materials to give birth to those baby cells so they're healthy and young and, and vibrant, and as long as we uh, remove the toxins, the body will clean itself and the body will rebuild itself. Your brain can rebuild itself. Your blood brain body can rebuild itself. Your lungs can rebuild themselves. Your joints can rebuild themselves. Your bones can rebuild themselves. Everything in the body can be rebuilt and can be cleaned. As a result, all kinds of a long list of diseases that our mainstream medicine considers to be incurable simply because they don't have the cure. They don't have the answer. That is why they call it incurable. But that doesn't mean that the answer doesn't exist elsewhere. I see people recovering from these disorders daily. And I have seen, I don't know how many people now to recover from multiple sclerosis and from rheumatoid arthritis and from lupus and from uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and neuropathies and narcolepsy and schizophrenia and autism and ADHD and psoriasis all kinds of uh, conditions that generally are considered to be incurable. Yeah. And it's just proven to me again and again that the human body is the healer. All the healing, human body is a miraculous creation. It is the pinnacle of evolution in nature. It has all the programs for healing and repairing itself and rejuvenating itself programmed into your body. All you have to do is remove the damaging element that keeps damaging the body and give the body building materials, give the body resources, and the body will heal itself. It will clean itself, it will heal itself, it will rebuild itself. No matter how incurable the disease might, might be pronounced by your mainstream. Yeah. 
No, that's no, a beautiful. So, coming back. Okay. So, so, Dr. Natasha, what feeds the bad bacteria and what feeds the good bacteria? Well, GAPS diet is quite a large area. It's a lot to talk about. It's quite complex. Uh, but we remove all the processed foods, all the junk food. We remove all starch. Starch is the biggest problem for people with digestive disorders because starch is a very large molecule under the microscope. It's very difficult to digest. Even for people with cast iron digestive system, starch, most of it goes undigested. And when it's undigested, it's a perfect food for microbes, the good and the bad. And if your gut is dominated by beneficial microbes, they will feed on the starch, they get stronger, and they make you healthier as a result. But in a GAPS person, their digestive system is dominated by pathogenic flora. It is the pathogens that feed on the starch, on the fiber, and they get stronger and they make you sicker as a result. So everything starchy has to be removed out of the diet for a long enough period of time to allow the gut to heal itself, to rebuild itself. And then when the person has fully recovered, starch can be reintroduced. Starch is contained in all grains, whether they're gluten-free or not gluten-free doesn't matter. Gluten is a separate issue, completely separate issue. But because we remove all grains from GAPS diet, GAPS diet is truly gluten-free. There are not even traces of it. Starchy vegetables are removed, potato and potato family, and uh, all processed foods are removed. All junk, anything in packets and tins, anything. Everything that the person eats is cooked at home from fresh ingredients. That's very, very important. And I go a lot into explaining how to get the best quality food, because the kind of food that you can buy in supermarkets is provided to us by our industrial agro agrochemical complex. And it is the worst quality food you can buy. You'll be surprised to hear that 75% of all the 7.6 billion people who live on our planet, 75% are not fed by that industrial agriculture. They'll be very keen to give you an idea that they're feeding the world. They're not. They're not. 75% of the world is fed by small organic farms and small holdings all over the world. So you will be surprised to find that in your own country and not very far away from you, there are many, many farms mm -hmm. who produce excellent quality food, organic, where animals are in the sunlight on pasture, pastured chickens and pastured cows and pastured sheep and proper organic gardens and proper vegetables and fruit and all the other uh, substances. And it's not very far from you and it is actually less expensive. Governments in the Western world subsidize agrochemical complex. They give them money. Yes. Well, nobody's giving money to these organic farmers. The only farmers who really survive are the ones who have a strong customer base. So by, by buying directly from the farmer, establishing contact with the farmer, visiting the farmer, seeing those chickens, seeing those animals, seeing those happy cows and happy sheep and happy pigs and happy gardens, um, you will be supporting something wonderful. And at the same time, you'll be getting good quality food for your own family. For yourselves. So I, that is what I, what I recommend to people and that's where we start getting the food. I love that. Our patients. That, that is a very important step. It is and I, I followed your recommendation and I ate for 15 months locally grown farmers market hand-picked um, foods and I cooked it myself twice a day. I you know very much followed your protocol and you know here I am to say I definitely healed. What would you recommend in terms of the foods that help to heal. So, so we took the star starches out, we took uh, you know, all the grains out. What are the foods that actually help heal and feed the good bacteria? Well, the most, the staple of uh, the GAPS diet is a good quality meat stock. I have all the recipes in my book, in the GAPS book, where we use all the cheap bits of the animal to make the stock. We want bones, we want joints, we want um, head, feet, skin, off cuts, and <laughs> organs, because organs have the highest nutrient content. A piece of liver will provide you with 100 times more nutrients than a, a piece of muscle of the animal. The muscle is actually the least nourishing part of the animal. The most nourishing are the organs and the joints and the ligaments and the bone marrow and the skin and the feet and the head and all these kinds of things. 
So that's what we're looking for. That is why when we buy meat, we buy it from a, an, an organic farmer, a proper farmer who's got his own animals and we can talk and we can see the animals so we know how they killed and how they grew up and what went into them, into these animals. And then you can buy a whole animal. You can buy a whole lamb cut into pieces for you. And all it takes is just getting a, a large freezer, put in your garage or somewhere else in your house. You can get it secondhand and put, out, put all that meat in there. So every day you can buy a half a pig, you can buy a quarter of a cow, you can buy 10 chickens, 10 ducks. So your freezer is full. So every day, every morning, when you wake up in the morning, you don't need to think that, oh, I need to go to the supermarket to think what I'm going to have for dinner. No, you go to your garage, to your freezer. You yes. take a piece of meat out to defrost or put it in a slow cooker in the morning before you go to work. And in the evening when you come back, it's ready. It's yes. there for you. All you need to do is just add a few vegetables yes. and you're done. Another very, very important, what these um, meat stocks do and all these gelatinous meat stocks particularly that we make, they provide the concentrated nutrition for those little cells in your gut wall to be born healthy and to feed them well. They will rebuild your gut wall with simple, inexpensive meals. And they're delicious, nutritious, and they keep for a long time. Once you made a good meat stock, it will keep in the fridge for 10 days at least. So what you, can you, always make yourself, yeah, you can always make yourself a meal out of that. What are your thoughts on the ready-made new sort of bone broths that are invading our, uh, our supermarkets? What are your thoughts on buying something right off the shelf versus making it yourself? On the GAPS protocol, we do not start with bone broth. Uh -huh. There's a difference between bone broth and meat stock. We use meat stock. Okay. Please read my book. The recipe yes. is there. It explains it. I know bone broths uh, have become popular. Do not start from the bone broth. Okay. It is important to start with the meat stock. It's, a, it's, it's something it. very, very different. Another part of the GAPS diet that is actually essential are fermented foods, and we ferment them at home. We make our own fermented vegetables and fermented uh, dairy products. And you can ferment meat and you can ferment fish. Anything can be fermented, really. Fermented foods are not optional for human beings because if you think about it, for most of our existence on the planet, we didn't have supermarkets yeah. where you can buy anything at any, any season. Right. Foods were seasonal. And we didn't have refrigeration. So things did not keep long. Mm -hmm. So if your cabbages, uh, you worked very hard the whole summer growing your cabbages, protecting them from slugs and snails and yeah. birds and any, any, anything else, and you've got a lovely harvest of cabbages. Natural cabbage that you grew in your own garden would not keep even a week. That's right. It'll rot, it'll wilt, it'll be gone. And for the rest of the year, you'll have no cabbage for most of our existence on our planet because there were no supermarkets where you can buy cabbage any time of the year. So what did people do to preserve? They fermented it. They made sauerkraut. They made fermented cabbage. They made kimchi. Because sauerkraut can keep for five years minimum. It keeps for years. It doesn't spoil. Wow. And also the beauty of fermented foods is that the bacteria in the process of fermentation pre-digest the food and release nutrients into the mixture. For example, the helping of sauerkraut has 20 times more bioavailable vitamin C in it than the same helping of fresh cabbage. Wow. Because in the fresh cabbage, vitamin C is locked in the cellular structure of the cabbage and your digestive system can't extract it. It just goes through you and doesn't do you any good. Where in a sauerkraut, the bacteria have already released it out of the cellular structure into the mixture and you can absorb it in minutes when you eat sauerkraut. James Cook, the uh, uh, British, uh, uh, famous British explorer who discovered Australia, New Zealand, and half the world, he never had scurvy on his ships. He had barrels and barrels of sour cabbage, as they called it, and every sailor was obliged to eat a helping of sour cabbage every single day. That is why they never had scurvy. They didn't know about vitamin C in those days, uh, but they just knew that sour cabbage prevents bleeding gums. That's why they had it there. So fermented food is pre-digested. It's much easier for the human digestive system to digest, to break down. It, it is teeming with uh, pre-digested nutrition. They're very nourishing. And at the same time, they're teeming with beneficial microbes. This is a probiotic food. And because humanity didn't have supermarkets and refrigeration 
for thousands and thousands of years, people ate most of their foods for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in a fermented form. Everything can be fermented. Meat, fish, grains, beans, vegetables, fruit, dairy, anything can be fermented. So people made beverages, people made uh, fermented vegetables, they fermented their meat, they fermented their fish. And as a result, a very large percent of human diet for most of our existence on this planet was fermented. And that got built into our physiology. And only in the recent times, fairly recent times, in the last few decades, uh, as the food industry changed all our recipes, we stopped having these foods, we stopped eating them. Uh, women got chased out of the kitchens, they've lost all the recipes, they forgot how to cook altogether, and we're depriving our physiology of something very, very important. And that is what we do in the GAPS nutritional protocol, we bring it back. We bring all the fermented foods back, we teach people how to ferment at home, and once you've done several jars of that sauerkraut, it will keep for many years and you will have a good supply of it. And it's very easy to make and, and very nourishing food. So these are the two major elements of the GAPS diet. What do you think of adding probiotics from a refrigerator section or taking external probiotics to give your body some healthy diversity and some healthy bacteria? That is the second part of the GAPS nutritional protocol, supplements. We have a short list of supplements, which are really foods. Uh, because you can spend an awful lot of money on supplements. It's a huge yes. business. Yes. But human body has been designed to receive its nourishment in the form of food, not in the form of pills. That's very important to remember. And GAPS diet is a nutrient-dense diet. It will remove food, uh, in, food deficiencies, nutritional deficiencies in your body fairly quickly and fairly completely. You will find that very fairly soon being on this diet, you won't need any supplements at all because they are expensive. But in the initial stages for certain patients, commercial probiotics are very helpful. And we use some cod liver oil and we use some fish oils. And in some patients we use digestive enzymes. And in, in, an, in other groups of patients, we use um, some specified specific uh, supplements, which can be very helpful if you know what you're doing. In order to know what you're doing, you need to work with a practitioner. For the last um, 10 years now, I've been training health practitioners we have more than 2,000 health practitioners all over the world who are certified GAPS practitioners. Mm. They're trained how to implement the protocol. They're listed on my website, gaps.me, G-A-P-S dot M-E. And uh, they're listed by country. And in America, they're listed by state. So you can find the practitioner close to you. But if it's not uh, close to you, then majority of them work by phone and by Skype or any other media that, that is suitable. So we have that uh, help now. And we are designing a course now for training uh, people not to be practitioners, but to be advisors. Mm. And what these people will do, these are people who went through the GAPS nutritional protocol themselves with their families, maybe with their children, maybe through their own illnesses. So they're already experienced. They have a lot of experience, these people, too fast. We're going to train these people and they will become GAPS advisors. And this will be hands-on people. This will be people who will be able to come into your home. And if you have fatigue, if you're tired, if you don't have time to cook, or you, you just can't get around to get organized, this person will come into your house and cook with you right. and prepare meals with you and answer your questions and support you, give you hands-on support um, in your own home if you need that kind of support, particularly in the initial stages. Because we've discovered that practitioners are wonderful, they can give good advice, they know what they're talking about, but many people are so fatigued, so tired, so debilitated, particularly people with fibromyalgia and chronic yes. fatigue syndrome, yes. NME, NMS, and many other conditions. They need that hands-on help. They need a qualified person who is there with them most of the day, who can hold their hand and take them through the whole, uh, through the whole thing. So we're just designing that, that course right now, and uh, we're setting up a GAPS training uh, company. It will be one hub called GAPS training, where we will have various courses for various people. We already have a course for practitioners, for training practitioners. We'll have the GAPS advisor course. Fairly soon we will have a cooking classes, cooking course for uh, cooking GAPS recipes in there, and other courses will come along as well. 
How so many there will people be have gone through the GAPS protocol, do you think? Nobody's counting. <laughs> uh, but but from, from where I stand, and uh, I, I could guess millions. Okay. Certainly, millions. Could you share? Over the world. My book has been translated into 18 languages. Yes. It's, yes. Uh, the information is all over the world. People are following this protocol in all kinds of countries all over the world. And I have practitioners all over the world. Could you We're share? Now doing doing practitioner courses in various languages, in different languages all over the world. Could you share a little bit about the way the actual protocol works? So you have an introduction phase, the full phase, just so our audience and our listeners get a better sense of what exactly is the GAPS diet. How do you start? How do you end? What happens in the middle? GAPS diet is divided into two. One is called the introduction diet. Another one is the full GAPS diet. You don't have to start from the introduction diet. You can start from either, depending on your practical, on your situation in your life. If you, your kitchen is not set up, if you haven't found the food yet, if you're not organized yet, or you need to learn to cook, uh, you need to learn the recipes, start from the full GAPS diet. You will achieve huge amount of healing with that diet, but it will also allow you to eat out and uh, um, will give you a much wider choice of foods. Introduction diet is something that you need to do when you are well organized and you've got time to be at home and time to cook and time to really dedicate um, to your health and to your diet. Because GAPS introduction diet will achieve deeper healing. It's very powerful. It's extremely powerful, but it is hard. It takes a, a lot of dedication and perseverance and a, a, a lot of time in, in, needs to be put into it. So you need to be prepared for practical reasons to do it. So when it's, uh, it comes to children, I recommend to do the introduction diet when the child goes on holiday. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to deal with teachers and with school because dealing with school and trying to do the introduction diet is very, very difficult. Hard. So it's best to do it in a long holiday, summer holiday, Easter holiday, or Christmas holiday at, at those times of, of, of year. And uh, for adults, it's a good idea to be at home for a while, to be able to cook, to be able to rest, to be able to dedicate to your health. It's very, very important. So um, we don't really have time to go into great detail about GAPS diet, but what I would like to talk about is um, animal foods versus plant foods. Oh, good. This, this is something very important for people to understand, that animal foods and plant foods work very differently in the human body. I had to learn this. I had to really research and study this subject because in my clinic, I've got a lot of uh, anorexic girls and a lot of young people with depression and bipolar disorder and various other mental illnesses where I discovered that the person became ill because of misguided vegetarianism, mm. particularly veganism. And that spurred an intensive study into this area and into how the animal foods work and how the plant foods work in the human body. And what I've, I now understand is that <clears throat> because of the way the human uh, digestive system is structured, only animal foods really feed and build the human body. These are the feeding, building foods. They build your heavy muscles and your heavy bones and your big heavy brain and your lungs and your heart and the digestive system and the rest of it, the rest of the body. While plant foods do not really provide much feeding for the human body, their purpose in nature and their purpose for us to eat them is in their cleansing ability. They're powerful cleansers. They keep the human body clean on the inside. It is important for human body to be well fed and to be clean. That is why we combine the two. It is possible for a human person, from my clinical experience with GAPS, it is possible for a human being to live entirely without plants, very healthfully. I started working with uh, this, this idea uh, developed several years ago when I was working with a group of children with ulcerative colitis, very severe situations. And these children just cannot digest any amount of plant matter. They just cannot handle any fiber at all because all plants contain fiber. So they were already on the introduction diet and we were removing and removing and removing plants until we finished up with no plants at all in this children's diet. They eat no plant matter at all. They live on meat stock, 
on meat, on fish, on eggs, and on fermented dairy, these children, mm -hmm. entirely. And I have now children who have been on this diet for six years. Beautiful children. They recover from ulcerative colitis. They recover from autism. They recover from mental illnesses, all kinds of things. Rosy cheeks, bushy tail, playing sports, doing very well at school, everything else. But every time we try to introduce a little bit of plant matter, symptoms start returning in these children. Wow. And I have adults like that with schizophrenia and other mental illnesses and people with multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis who are very well and healthy. They've recovered from their disorder fully. But as soon as they try to introduce a little bit of plant matter, they regress. All symptoms start returning in these people. We haven't found an answer there yet, but why? But the fact is, and that's what my clinical experience has taught me and demonstrated to me, that human beings can live perfectly healthily without plants at all. However, human beings cannot live without animal foods. They cannot. Because only animal foods have the right kind of protein and the right kind of fats to build the human body. Remember I mentioned this to you, that human body renews itself all the time. All cells in the human body only have a short life. They get old, they get worn out, they get killed and, sh and removed and replaced by newly born uh, baby cells. In order to give birth to those cells, building materials are required. So what are these cells made from? When we take away water from the human body, about 70% of your body is water. The dry weight is about 50-50, protein and fat. Half fat, half protein. So these are the two structural elements that we are made from, our bodies are made from. When we analyze the structure of that protein in the human body, it's amino acid composition, we discover that it's very similar in its structure to meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Proteins are just perfect in those foods for converting into our own proteins. When we analyze the fat in the human body, we discover that in its biochemical structure, it's very similar to the lamb fat, beef fat, pork fat, goose fat, duck fat, butter, ghee. Perfect fats for it. So those fats digest very easily in the human digestive system and very easy for the boy, for your body to convert into its own structural fats because fats in your body are the structural elements. 50% of your dry weight is fat. It's very essential, very important to understand that fats are not optional. They are your structure, 50% of you. However, when we analyze the protein in the plants, plants have lots of proteins in them. Gluten is one example. The more we research gluten, the more we discover nobody can digest gluten. No human being on this planet, even those who don't develop any symptoms from gluten, eating gluten, cannot tolerate it. It's just their body build up a resistance and symptoms do not show up, but the damage is happening. The more we research proteins in the plants, we find out that not only they're indigestible for the human digestive system and have a lot of damaging elements in them like gluten does, on top of that, their amino acid composition is inappropriate for building your own proteins in your body. Certain amino acids are in short supply, other amino acids are in excess. The whole balance is wrong for building your protein in your body. The same with fats. When we look at the fats in the plant matter, majority of them are polyunsaturated and their biochemical structure is inappropriate for the human fat. Majority of your fats are saturated or monounsaturated, and they have a certain composition. And the only perfect fats that convert easily into our structural fats are animal fats. Plant fats are inappropriate in their biochemical composition. So plants are not designed to feed the human body, to build the human nuts? body. nuts? Nuts are very difficult to digest. They're highly fibrous. They have a lot of lectins in them, a lot of fetus in them, a lot of anti-nutrients. So nuts need to be treated appropriately in order for them to be even digested properly. And for people with digestive disorders, they are very difficult to handle nuts. We have to introduce them quite a bit later. Uh, um, so they will supply you with some good things, but they can never replace a piece of meat, a piece of liver, wow. or an this egg, or a yogurt, or a piece of cheese. They cannot. And what we also need to understand that um, all energy on our beautiful planet is recycled. New energy comes from the sun. In order to capture that sunlight and convert it into solid matter that somebody can touch and eat, Mother Nature created plants. They have photosynthesis. They capture the sunlight and convert it into green matter. 
green mass, the, 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 the uh, solid stuff that we can touch and we can eat. Then in order for something else to benefit from the sunlight in the form of plants, Mother Nature created herbivorous animals. And in order for these animals to be able to digest the plant matter, Mother Nature gave them a very special digestive system called rumen. Cows, giraffes, antelope, deer, and other uh, goats and other uh, herbivorous animals, they have a huge multi-chamber stomach. A cow has four stomachs. And the stomachs are full of microbes. A huge community, that's where the bulk of her gut flora lives, in her rumen. Because the fact, the biochemical fact, scientific fact, well established in the science, is that nobody on this planet can digest plant matter apart from microbes. Only microbes are able to digest plant matter. Nobody else can do it. Wow. And this is the fact that Mother Nature used in creating herbivorous animals. It packed their rumen full, jam-packed full of microbes. And it is these microbes that digest the grass that the cow eats. And they convert it into uh, substances that then absorb and the cow can benefit from. And it's interesting that about 70% of all the carbohydrates in the grass, in the plant matter that the cow eats, are absorbed in the form of short-chain fatty acids, which are fully saturated fat. So a cow actually lives on a very high-fat diet. <laughs> and that's <laughs> for, for microbes. Then in order for something else to benefit from the sunlight in the form of herbivorous animals, Mother Nature created another group of creatures on the planet, omnivores and predators. Our bodies belong in that group. We only have, we don't have a rumen, we only have a tiny little stomach. And if that stomach is healthy, it's virtually sterile. It has virtually no microbes in it because it produces hydrochloric acid. Mm -hmm. And the acidity can go below one, pH two or one, in a healthy stomach when we're hungry, when we're ready to eat. And that creates a very hostile environment for any kind of micro. The only things that that human stomach can digest and really unravel and break properly are meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. These what are the about? things that really digest properly in the human stomach. And then they get passed into the intestines and that's where the bulk of absorption happens. So whatever managed to get digested properly in the human stomach gets absorbed in the intestines and that's what feeds and build our bodies. Whatever got undigested was under indigestible, goes through those several meters of the intestine and lands in the bowel. And the bowel is where the bulk of the gut flora is in the human beings. That's the equivalent of the rumen in the cow in us. The problem is in the cow, her rumen is at the beginning of her digestive system. Where in us human beings, our rumen, the bowel, is at the end. When it's too late to do absorption, absorption's already happened. Digestion has already happened. So what finishes up in the bowel is plant matter. Fiber is indigestible. Starch is mostly indigestible. And this is the two major blocks, building blocks of all the plant matter on the planet. And this plant matter feeds the, our flora, our gut flora in the bowel. And uh, whatever that gut flora can extract, it will then release into the bloodstream. So we absorb some of the starches in the form of uh, short chain fatty acids again, uh, those saturated fats that the cow absorbs, and some other things to um, sustain us between meals. But the bulk of digestion and absorption has already happened much higher up in the digestive system in a human being. That is why feeding, building foods for us are only animal foods. Plants are indigestible for human beings, and plants are cleansers. They do not feed us to any degree. People in traditional societies throughout tens of thousands of years understood this fact very well. That is why they would go a long mile to get meat, to get fish, to get eggs, to get milk. And they would eat plants to supplement their diet, to supplement what they could get in the animal kingdom. And they developed various methods of treating plants in a way that to make them a little bit more digestible, a little bit more feeding, uh, a little bit less cleansing. The more we cook plants, Cement plants of fermentation, molting, sprouting, and cooking makes plants less cleansing, but more digestible and more feeding. So it isn't black and white, obviously. Um, this division is not black and white. Animal products, particularly when they're raw, not only feed us very well, but they have a very powerful cleansing ability. I've discovered uh, a few years ago that raw egg white actually is one of the most powerful metal chelators. 
you can chelate lead and mercury and other things out of your body very, very effectively. While plants, when they are sprouted, malted, um, fermented and cooked, can feed the body to a degree, but the division is quite strong. That is why veganism is not a diet, it is a fast. It is a form of fasting. You come from India, and I was I went, going to ask you, so how do you explain? Right, let me talk about this, let me talk about India. I went to India several years ago, just in the time when I was researching veganism, because I had all these anorexic girls to deal with. <laughs> and um, the guy told us that all these Hindu pilgrims that are traveling long distances across India to their sacred sites, and they wear special clothes. They wear black clothes with a golden brim. And the guy told us that part of their pilgrimage is a fast, a 42-day fast, 41-42-day fast. And as it happened, next day I was on the beach and I come across a group of these pilgrims and I spoke to them and I've asked them, I said, what kind of fast is it? Please tell me. And they looked so exhausted, these people. They looked so tired and uh, they all speak English very well in India. They, the majority of people speak English. Yeah. So we had a good conversation. So I said, what kind of fast is it? Are you allowed to eat something or do you just drink water or, or what? And, and they, you know how they bob their heads? Yes. And uh, they, they, they said, oh, it's very difficult, very, so difficult. <laughs> and I said, so what, what is it? You know, what, what do you eat? And I said, well, we're only allowed to eat, listen to this, rice, lentils, beans, vegetables, fruit, bread, and vegetable oil. And I thought, ah, that's the Western vegan diet. Mm -hmm. These people consider it to be a fast and have considered it for millennia to be a fast, and they will not do it longer than 42 days, and they say it's very difficult. And what I also discovered talking to people in India, traveling around India, that people in India value animal foods far more than plant foods. All the people who live along the coasts of oceans and sea eat fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Seafood is their staple. People who live along rivers and lakes also eat a lot of fish. People who live inland and who are vegetarian, they're not vegetarian by choice, they're vegetarian out of necessity. Because there are so many people in India, and in, India was always overpopulated. If they start eating their animals, they'll probably eat them all in two weeks. There'll be nothing left. Why do you think a cow is a sacred animal in India? Because these people knew through experience, through tens of thousands of years, that without a cow, without ghee and butter and milk and cheese and cream, they will perish because the cow provides them with the only food that sustains and builds their bodies. And also these people all have chickens and ducks and they eat a lot of eggs and goats and they value goat milk very much. And when they do get meat, when they get any chance to eat meat and fish, they eat it with relish, they eat it. Western veganism has arrived to India in the 1930s through the activities of some um, vegan uh, evangelists such as Nathan Pritikin and, and other people who wrote very successful books which were translated and uh, they, their beliefs uh, have arrived to India and that kind of created some of the religious uh, beliefs into veganism and so on but traditionally people in India were vegetarian because of necessity because of poverty because of meat not being available that is why, but they always ate lots of dairy and valued it more than anything else and lots of eggs. And when they could get fish and, and meat, they would eat them. So that is the picture in India. So veganism is not a diet. It is a form of fasting. There are many people in this world who could do with a good fast because their bodies are so toxic. So these are the people who start when they move on the, onto a vegan uh, protocol. They feel so much better in the first few weeks because a cleaner body feels much better than a toxic one. But at certain point after a few weeks uh, when the body finished cleansing, it will get hungry and it will ask for an animal food. It will give you a desire for a piece of meat, for a pot of cream, for a piece of cheese or for something else animal. But problem is many of these uh, vegans in the Western world do it for emotional reasons, political reasons, religious reasons and other reasons they override the signal from their body. They don't listen to their body. They force it to continue fasting, to continue being a vegan. And that is the point when the body runs out of nutrients and it starts cannibalizing less important tissues, such as muscle and bone, 
to feed more important tissues, such as the brain, the heart, the lungs, and the liver. And that's when the person starts getting ill. That's when the person starts developing degenerative disease. And, and that's what I see with many, many youngsters. Misguided veganism, misguided vegetarianism has become a major cause of mental illness amongst our young people. Because they don't do any uh, research, they don't do any study um, in, into the value of food and how to structure their diet. They just continue eating processed food, they just remove out all the animal foods. And as a result, the body starts starving and they fall uh, into, into, the, into disease, they fall into the illness. So the result of this research is my new book that, I, that came out last year called Vegetarianism Explained. If you know anybody, any young person who is considering a plant-based lifestyle, please give them that book. You might save a life. You might yeah. save somebody because I've seen so many young people who destroyed their health and destroyed their lives uh, through misguided veganism, through misguided vegetarianism. Uh, it is a book that doesn't dictate anything. It just explains. It just gives them the full spectrum of information. And there are good pictures there. So it will be enjoyed by a 15-year-old and a 16-year-old, this book, because I've written it in an easy-to-understand language, but it is fully referenced for professionals and for scientists. Wow. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Wow. I've, I've never uh, heard such support for a meat-based uh, diet versus vegetarianism. And, and so I think this is going to create a lot of great conversation for sure. I've, I made sure to not to incorporate my views in, into this interview in terms of um, vegetarian versus veganism versus uh, a meat dominant diet. So Dr. Natasha, thank you for sharing. You know, clearly you have very strong opinions about the importance of incorporating meat. And uh, for those of you that uh, want to know more details, you know, definitely check out her, her book that came out last year. So is it a myth? that the bacteria, the good bacteria needs plant-based fiber and that it needs a lot of fiber? And then what are your thoughts on constipation? It is, a, it is uh, what you need to understand that fiber and starch feed equally the good and the bad microbes in the gut. If, your gut is if you've got a healthy gut flora and your gut is dominated by beneficial microbes, they will feast on the starch, they will feast on the fiber, they get bigger and stronger, and as a result, you get healthier. But unfortunately, a growing proportion of Western population has abnormal gut flora. From where I stand, it's the majority. We're getting very rapidly to a situation where pretty much everybody will have damaged gut flora, full of pathogens. And these pathogens will feast on the starch and fiber just as well. I see. And they will get stronger, and they will get bigger, and as a result, make you sicker. Gotcha. That is why in a GAPS introduction diet in particular, we have to remove starch. We, we remove starch in the GAPS diet altogether, but in the introduction diet, we also remove fiber as much as possible out of the people's diet because they simply can't digest it. And it keeps feeding their pathogens in the digestive system. We have to reestablish normal gut flora first. Uh, then the person gradually and slowly will be able to introduce some fibrous foods and then when they fully recover, then we can bring in starch as well. And so the question is, when you initially remove everything, of course, you end up with constipation because there's, there's such drama going on inside. And of course, you have some die off as well. So at what point does the good bacteria start to grow back, given that the diet is designed to, in essence, starve everything that's in there by not feeding them the things that they live on, like the plant-based fibers and the starches? In different people recover in different uh, period of time. You can't give a, a standard time to everybody. If we're dealing with a person with multiple sclerosis, for example, uh, that person will take much longer to recover than a person with a simple irritable bowel syndrome uh, or something, something uh, quite mild. Okay. So it, it, it takes different amount of time for different people to recover. But fermented foods are key. Okay. They, you keep putting there, you keep putting microbes in there more and more and more and more. The more the merrier. Okay. It is important to start from a small amount. You don't watch yourself, you know, on the first day on a large helping of sauerkraut because you'll, you'll feel very sick for a long time because these beneficial microbes, when they come into your digestive system, they'll start killing pathogens. Yes. Killing them. When these pathogens die, they release toxins. Yes. And these are the toxins which make you hyperactive, depressed, obsessed, 
or give you eczema or give you asthma or give you psoriasis or give you rheumatoid arthritis or any your or anything else uh, of your individual symptoms awesome. so if you suddenly kill off a large amount of those pathogens by eating a large helping of fermented food or taking a large dose of probiotics you will throw yourself into a very severe die-off reaction that's what it's called die-off reaction there's a more scientific name to it called Herzheimer reaction but we call it a die-off reaction so it's important to control this reaction that's why we start with one teaspoon per day of a fermented food initially start killing those microbes gradually in, in the amounts that you can handle yes that your body can handle yes. and increase them gradually 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 the same we do with commercial probiotics Love so it's it. very important to do that Love it. Dr. Natasha, you are such a fountain of brilliant information, research, and you have helped, literally helped millions of people. I'm one of those. I used to be a vegetarian. I was a born vegetarian. And during my healing, I definitely added some chicken liver and some wild Atlantic salmon, etc. So I really appreciate all the great work that you are doing to help people like myself and like the millions out there that are suffering from all kinds of gut-related issues. Thank you so much. Any parting advice for someone that wants to get started right away? What's the one big piece of advice that you would give? Read my book. Read my website. The website is a, a, an informational website. Read right. my other books. I don't have right. many books, <laughs> but every one of them it was, was written out of necessity. It was really a, a necessity for that information. So, and that will give you a lot of information. It will give you hope. And there's one more book that uh, I would recommend to many people. It's called Gaps Stories. I was receiving letters from people from all over the world, very powerful letters of recovery from all kinds of illnesses. Illnesses that I haven't even listed on my website or on my, in my book or anywhere else. And these people never had any consultations with anybody. They just got the book, they followed the program and they recovered. Mm -hmm. So I got permission of these people and we published those stories as a book called Gaps Stories. Half of the book are families with children, half of the book are adults. And people recovered from amazing list of disorders, including chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia and multiple sclerosis and neuropathies and a full spectrum of mental illness, narcolepsy and epilepsy and uh, alcoholism and autism and all kinds of things. Wow. Please read that book. Many of these people were kind enough to uh, provide their phone numbers and their email addresses. They're happy to be contacted by people who are in the same situation or in the same boat. And they will be very happy to give you advice and give you support. This book will give you hope and inspiration yes. Yes. to start healing yourself. Thank you. I don't believe there are hopeless situations. Um, I don't believe that there are hopeless situations. Human body is a wonderful creation. It is your own body that heals itself. Not the doctor, not the diet, not the pill. Yes. So you have to learn to trust it and you have to learn to work with it rather than throw things at it. So, and, and that is a process, that is a journey to get back in touch with yourself, to get respect for your body, to get love for it. Because every healing has to begin from starting to love yourself. Without love, there can be no healing. Absolutely. So don't lose hope. People have recovered from all kinds of um, horrendous situations. Yes. Beautifully said. Dr. Natasha, thank you so much for all your time. And for the rest of you, it starts with love. It starts with trust. Learn to love and trust your body. Listen to it and definitely check out the book. It absolutely was a critical instrument in my own healing, in my own journey. So uh, with that said, stay smiling and I'll see you on another one of our podcasts soon. And check out Health Boot Camps if you're looking for the support for a 14-day program to beat cancer, beat gut issues, beat heart disease, and more. I'll see you soon.